theme parks. From Disney to Universal to Busch Gardens to Six Flags to SeaWorld to Legoland, these truly are humanity's greatest creation, the final step of evolution. You can't tell me none of you have It's a Small World bumping 26 times in a row on a Spotify playlist before you go to Disney. These places get that imagination working overtime. Like what if I got to build my own roller coasters? I would make it do 63 flips and fly off into space and come back with a smooth landing defying all grounds of reality and physics known to humans. Luckily, there is a place we can do that. And as a baby boy, I had always played Roller Coaster Tycoon on the family computer. And there's certainly no shortage of theme park management games out there now. More recently, thanks to the concept that is cleaning out the PS2 memory cards, I was reintroduced to a game series that had long sunk its way into the recesses of my subconscious. And that series is Thrillville. And its sequel to Off the Rails. And funny enough, Thrillville was developed by Frontier, and yeah, it's the Frontier that made these guys right here. Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, Planet Coaster, Planet Zoo, and Zoo Tycoon. Which is pretty cool because I had never realized as a kid. And when I found these safe files, bro, they said some shish like last played in 2007. I'm talking like 15 years ago. Just under like 75% of my lifespan ago, I had played these games. From the memory fragments I have left of them, I remember thoroughly loving them, especially the sequel. So I wanted to take a look at why I have some fond memories of these games, and I wanted to find out if they're still any good. What can one expect from the first commercially successful theme park management game to show up on consoles? So after playing the first game, I found myself wondering why I would have ever liked it, even as a child. Its story is very straightforward with narrative. You're either a kid or an early to mid teenager who's got a quirky scientist Uncle Mortimer that likes theme parks as much as any normal person does, and he owns a group of parks collectively known as Thrillville. While he's busy doing quirky scientist stuff, you have to run theme parks. Each park acts as its own expansive level. The parks consist of three themed areas each that you can transition to without any load times, kind of like Jack 1. Each area then features two coaster slots in each themed area, alongside carnival rides, minigame stations, food and drink stalls, as well as souvenirs for the guests. Emphasis on the minigame stations though, Jesus Christ. <laughs> The guests feature their own dialogue trees, and some of which have unique quests attached to them where you can become friends with the people in your park or challenge them to games. In this game, it's kind of mid. It just ends up being surface level interactions between you and the NPCs as you loop the same punchlines, the same pickup lines, the same textbook facts to the point where I just start spam clicking through every questline dialogue and shish just to satisfy quest requirements rather than caring about what they actually had to say. These are hardly real conversations, and I certainly avoided this system through the majority of my playtime. Maybe back when I was seven, the goldfish brain didn't really care how surface level the character interaction was, despite how much they advertise and market this interaction. Coming back now, in a world where some games have narratives comparable to full length novels, it's pretty unremarkable. Hello. Hey there. Don't hate me, but. Who are you again? I'm the park manager. Can we be friends? Don't you recognize me? I'm the park I'm manager. I'm the new park manager. That's an awesome job! You're so lucky! Should I complain? Or should I say it's pretty good? Yeah, it's pretty fun. Oh my god, the bloom on that fucking sun. This is definitely mid. Our coasters are superb. You should try them out. Yeah, they were okay. My coasters are mid? Alright, kid. Get the fuck out of here. Wig. Mortimer wig? paid for his first roller coaster ride by selling his hair to wig companies. Hey, maybe my wig is made out of his hair. My wig. Wait, the, the thing went down. The fucking the friendship meter went down. Good vocabulary. That's a little, uh, <laughs> a little susty. Mini golf. Have you had to go on our mini golf course? I heard that someone found sneaky shortcuts on some of the holes. I could play mini golf all day. I'm friends with him. A strange secret. Mm -hmm. 
I did it. What's important is the parks. Each park essentially starts with a bar that after you complete enough missions, you can unlock the next park. The farther along you are, the more missions you need to complete for the next park. Missions can also award you cash as well as themed buildables for the park that you're in. I found that to be a really neat touch where you can kind of pick your favorite theme and really go hard in that level and invest a lot of time in it and unlock everything for it and so on. Each level has research, and that's kind of self-explanatory. You can allot a certain amount of cash monthly to put into researching new attractions for the park that can unlock new minigames or allow you to complete new missions or build coasters unique to that area. And I think if you haven't noticed it by now or just haven't played, Thrillville seems to be running off the tails of Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 and its DLC in 2004 and 2005. Thrillville is basically console's version of that even down to the character models and the AI pathing and their behaviors. If you told me Thrillville was Rollercoaster Tycoon 3's spinoff DLC, I'd believe you. And you want to know something even crazier, bro? This game was published by LucasArts as well. Yeah, bro, that LucasArts, the ones who published all of them Star Wars games. And here's where it kind of gets funny. Okay, so I've got my tinfoil hat on. Around the same time I was playing Thrillville as a kid, I also played this Star Wars game known as Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. It came out in 2002 from what I remember and it was pretty fire. It was a first person shooter with both crazy guns and lightsaber duels in multiplayer as well as a story mode. I don't know how it holds up today but regardless I'm sure you're wondering why this is important. Well I'm so glad I said that you asked because in Thrillville there are these like mini games and one of them is an FPS, and I'm fairly certain that the engine they used to make the FPS minigames are either a fragment of or a version of the same engine in that game. Not that I know much about game development or anything, but creating this sort of Doom-like Metroid Prime-esque combat inside of a theme park management game it doesn't seem too unlikely for LucasArts to have shared some dev tools when greenlighting Thrillville and its minigames. I have no way to prove this, and I could be 100% incorrect, but I definitely get some vibes from the FPS wing of LucasArts. Just compare these two shots of this gun from Jedi Knight 2 and this gun from the minigame. I think Thrillville's biggest weakness is that at the time, and even now, the game wasn't doing anything super unique for the coaster sim genre that it was trying to be a part of, other than the fact that it was for consoles rather than PC only. Like yeah, we get some cool locales too, and get the full scale of the things we build by having everything be accessed by a playable character, and interacting with the guests is a thing, but I would rather it be in a deeper, more engaging way, something I personally wish there was more of in the sim genre in general. And I've really only seen it be possible with Rovo. Because for me, when playing a sim game, I always feel detached from caring about the world I'm creating, but giving the player a direct line to feedback makes me feel more attached emotionally, in a way that I don't get from being a floating head in the sky with god powers. In Thrillville, they really needed to double down on the coasters and what you can build, and how you can build it, because overall in this replay, Thrillville has felt a lot like a collection of really mid-indie games from the coding students of a university, rather than a AAA coaster sim game, because of all of the interactive elements that progress you through each park, just being minigames, essentially. But then Thrillville Off the Rails comes out, and while a lot of the things stay largely the same at their core, things come out bigger and better than they were before. This year we'll be unveiling our all new whoa coasters. These outrageous new coasters can only be found at Thrillville. Using my patented mortifier technology, they'll uh, uh, push the limits of fun and excitement. <laughs> From an increase in total build height, the total amount of attractions in the game, way better quality minigames that still do make up a pretty big bulk of the gameplay, a decently improved dialogue system, a much more coherent and followable narrative, and finally, the introduction of woe coasters and woe track pieces. So, starting off with the narrative, the lightly mentioned Globo Joy in the previous game has returned and is back for round 2, and this time they're using dirty methods of trying to weaken the power of Thrillville. Your job is to prevent and solve problems throughout Thrillville while also completing missions and keeping guests happy just like the first game. The missions that directly intertwine with that mainline plot aren't really indicated to us any other different way than the other missions, so it requires you to pay a little bit more attention than you might like, but once you hit that last park, all of the guests you interact with, like Blake Steak, Jake Steak, Timothy Twinklefingers, Mopots, and some other types of reoccurring guests, most of which did make appearances in the first game as well, give some neat continuity that kind of wraps up the plot lines nicely. 
Most of the reoccurring guest missions involve playing games and beating that guest at the game or beating their score. But now that the games are significantly better than they were before, it's much less painful. And let me emphasize, less painful. Also listen to the worst attempt at a German accent I've ever heard. Seems impossible, but you have defeated me! That game was really close. It was close, but you were magnificent. And it seems that you may be the greatest pilot who has ever lived. Very von Tobin does not resort to sneaking around. He faces his enemies in the open. I am almost certainly not the park saboteur. Despite what you think of me, I am a man of honor. After five parks of many missions in each, you come to a plot thread that has you and Uncle Mortimer convinced that there is some kind of internal spy working for Globojoy, which is why upon arrival of each park, you come across new problems such as an overflow of robot guests, sonic weapons that turn human guests into mindless zombies, planted workers that will reduce the maintenance level of your attractions, and so on. I think it's far more interesting and interactive and world building than the plot of the first game by far. After confronting each of the reoccurring guests, they all convince us that actually, hey, it's Tom Dingleberry who is the real saboteur, and what do you know, he really is. Now, I'm sorry it has to end this way. Should I call you Tim or Vernon Garrison Jr.? Either way, your secret is out. You've done your homework. Call me Vernon Garrison Jr. No, wait. Call me the Destroyer of Thrillville. Yeah, the Destroyer of Thrillville sounds a lot better. He outs himself as Globojoid Man Jr and vows to have his revenge in the trilogy sequel that never happens. And woohoo, game over, yay, we did it, we beat Globo Joy. And obviously the plot was never the real appeal of Thrillville, but it was nice having more of a motivation to continue through each park and max out their level. As a kid, I don't even have any memories of a holiday park. At the very least, I have like teeny tiny flashes of deja vu, but that's about it. So doubt I even cared about the plot back then. What we care about is attractions and roller coasters. As mentioned before, minigames are significantly better from their shitty counterparts in the first game. I actually enjoyed some of the games like Saucer Sumo, Saucer Soccer, aka Rocket League Zero, Event Horizon 2, and Robo KO. At least until I found the spammable combo that would wash any opponent over and over again. But the coasters. Oh boy, the coasters. Off the Rails not only brings in the old roster of coasters, completely new coasters show up as well. A lot of them feature new and unique WoW track pieces that tie in nicely with the title of the game. We have things that are kind of like elevator track pieces, track pieces that launch the train from one side of the map to another, crane lifts, and all types of fantastical pieces you can find in the game. And that is what I think Thrillville needed to stand out and is what still keeps it standing out today. Like think in Roller Coaster Tycoon, right? You leave a coaster unfinished and all of a sudden your park is closed and you're wanted for massacring two families like geez. But in Thrillville you leave a track unfinished and oopsie doopsie you got your parachutey woody. God what the fuck am I writing? And they carefully float back down to the ground where they can jump back on and do it again. It's really a novel idea, and something I legit haven't seen in any other theme parks in. And you really have to give them credit for designing the WoW track pieces and the WoW coasters. I know it's not really in the bounds of physical reality and human safety, but come on man, we're playing video games. There's plenty of theme park sims revolving around cool themes, but none of them that change the fundamental understanding of what a coaster can be. None like Thrillville at least. And I would have loved a modern take on this style of coaster building, but all we have now is Thrillville off the rails, and honestly, I'm okay with that. Oh, what else? What else? Oh, the soundtrack in Off the Rails actually goes hard. From Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana to OK Go, the Veronicas and the Vines, this game is basically a time capsule of mediocre pop music from the mid-2000s, and I love it a lot. The shit vibes real hard. You're telling me you don't want to bump East Northumberland High while building your newest roller coaster at 10 p.m. on a school night? Then you're surely not a viewer of mine. <laughs> Also, Thrillville 1 and Off the Rails take a huge hit for me because of the fact that even though I did barely mess with the social system, there are no gays allowed in Thrillville. Like, I know gay people weren't invented until 2015, but come on guys, have some imagination. But anyways, I think that kind of wraps it up for Thrillville. I know I didn't say a whole lot, but that's because there really isn't a ton to say. It's a pretty straightforward experience, just like the sexualities of every NPC. It's a theme park held... <laughs> 
It's a theme park sim held back by the limitations of its medium. I would really love to see the sequel that they set up in the closing of the game, especially with all the current hardware that we have now. I mean, it's a totally different game genre and everything, but the revival of LEGO Star Wars is quite literally unprecedentedly amazing. And while they had the backing of massive media conglomerate that is Disney now, I could totally see Thrillville coming back in the same way. Also, here's some more Star Wars references in the...